So we're in a room filled with folks who have worked in environmental justice for years, maybe even decades, and there are other folks who have, maybe they've heard the phrase, but they're not totally sure what it is we're talking about. And so as our friends here on stage who know a lot about environmental justice are having this conversation, we're going to try to marry the two and bring folks along for the ride, but also have a well-informed conversation about this great work and environmental justice and how it's different than when we just think about the word environment or environmental policy. So, Ertha, I'm actually going to start with you. The Midwest EJ Network was established more than 15 years ago. The environmental justice movement started well before that. So, let's start off by helping us understand the history and legacy of the environmental justice movement in this region. Just a softball question to start. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that question could probably be a semester's long um, conversation, but I would say um, there's a long, rich history of environmental justice in our region, which is connected to our social and economic uh, movements across the country. Um, I know my colleagues are going to talk about indigenous communities and their connection to environmental justice and rural communities, but I would say we could probably start the conversation of the EJ movement back to the period of colonization and the genocide of indigenous people um, and the removal of them from their land and the land theft, and that's a thread um, that comes all the way to present day in our region because we see our indigenous leaders leading the movement for environmental justice. Um, our most visible, in the most visible way, we see that at Standing Rock, um, folks op opposing pipelines in line three, line five. Um, so I would just say that, I know Davis is gonna talk more about that. Um, but also along that time frame, the, the Midwest has been a really important place for our labor and environmental justice movements. Um, and in, particularly in the city context, as the Great Migration happened, our cities became segregated because of a long history of racist policies, particularly related to um, land use and zoning, redlining, racial covenants and housing. And that led to um, the disproportionate siting of things like highways, right? We see that here in Minneapolis with ha Highway 94 and the Rondo neighborhood, um, and also large industrial facilities uh, in black and brown neighborhoods. Um, and so it's within that context that the Midwest DJ Network was founded. Um, we, over 15 years ago now, we had groups of folks coming together from the south side of Chicago and the Little Village neighborhood who were fighting a coal fire power plant there in their neighborhood, folks on the front line of the drinking access water crisis in Detroit that were fighting for access to water and against land grabs, and then mothers here in Minneapolis that were working on reimagining industrial zoning um, laws. And so that kind of brings us to the present day with the Midwest EJ Network. Um, we're really thinking about um, how to bring people together and build relationships um, that, to share strategies because we're really fighting similar battles across different cities. Um, and so for us, what we've seen over the last 15 years is that when you invest in grassroots solutions, you, we can make long-term systems change. So one example of that is here in Minnesota with the, the passing of the Cumulative Impacts Law, which um, requires the MPCA to consider the multiple burdens of communities, pollution in communities when uh, issuing a permit for uh, the project. So that kind of brings it full circle to this point where we are. We mentioned we've talked a lot about the, the climate crisis so far and, and how that's gonna have a disproportionate impact on our environmental justice communities in the Twin Cities. And so what we're really working on with the Midwest EJ Network is to continue to resource frontline organizations so that we can have long-term systems change. I'll just follow up on that real quickly because it, there seems to be a theme in what you said about the thing I'm doing today might not feel like it's doing much, right? Like it's not having an effect. And I think especially in the area of environment, we all feel that way, right? That we're not being able to do enough. But, but you're actually giving us a vision of hope where that actually can lead to bigger things. 
That's right. I think that environmental justice at its base is about self-determination and um, about communities being at the table to make decisions that are about them. And that we've seen that that type of investment in communities, in organizations can lead to this widespread policy and systems change. And I think we also believe that as we um, come to this acceleration of the climate crisis, that the solutions to the climate crisis and how we're going to adapt live with our communities. And that's really important. That's really great. Davis, uh, to the point Eartha began with in her answer, what, what does environmental justice mean for the indigenous community, communities? Thank you for the question. Hello, my kako. My name is Davis Price, uh, the Climate Justice Initiative Director for Indian Collective. I'm Native Hawaiian based in Oahu, Hawaii. Uh, so it's interesting to be here. <laughs> um, not too far away, but in the spirit of our indigenous knowledge systems, that I already hear and see things that connect us all, our water. And so, you know, uh, as an example, our water. But, you know, NDN Collective, um, just to share a little bit of background, you know, we're a native-led national nonprofit organization that is committed to empowering indigenous communities um, to defend, develop, decolonize, um, and what that means is defending our sacred spaces, our lands, our waters, developing the indigenous solutions to maintain those spaces and develop them responsibly and decolonizing systems that prevent us from governing those resources and that have taken those resources from us. And NDN has done this work since 2018 through the vision of our founder, Nick Tilson, who's Oglala Lakota um, from Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Um, you know, amazing vision to recognize that less than 1% of American philanthropic dollars were reaching indigenous communities or have or reach indigenous communities. And since 2018, NDN has rematriated over nearly $100 million to over 900 indigenous led individuals, organizations and projects across North America and the Pacific territories. Uh, and a lot of that work is grounded in climate justice. You know, coming from Hawaii, I, I want to share, you know, I have to start with when I explain what climate justice is to family and friends and, and environmental justice, I, I have to start with what is environmental injustice. And for, you know, unfortunately, there's something that most people in the room are probably familiar with. We had a massive wildfire last year in Lahaina that completely destroyed a historic town and displaced thousands of people. Um, and within days of that, what people don't know mo <laughs> nationally, um, you know, my background is legal policy advocacy, public policy advocacy around Native Hawaiian rights, water issues, land use. Um, that's how I ended up with the organization NDN. But um, so very familiar with these challenges in Hawaii. And, and within days of that fire occurring, there was a narrative that was launched by a large landowner, a private landowner, who had been fighting with the Native Hawaiian community for decades about control of water. And the Native Hawaiian community was a community of traditional farmers who were trying to restore water flows that stemmed, that were had been diverted for 200 years um, by an extractive industry, sugar. So what a lot of people don't know more know is Hawaii, 5,000 miles away from here, 2,500 miles away from the coast of California, was the, pretty much the hub for American sugar for the better part of two centuries. Um, so a lot of our agricultural land, almost all of it, was dedicated or converted to sugar production using diversion of water from our natural stream flows. And it's been a sugar that, you know, like most extractive industries do, when things get too costly, they pick up and leave. And um, it's been a struggle to get those waters restored. Immediately after the fire, this narrative was launched that there wasn't enough water to fight the fire because Native Hawaiian farmers had reclaimed <laughs> water in the region. Uh, it's, I laugh about it, but it was incredibly hurtful and bizarre that that narrative could even catch traction. Since that time, just a couple of weeks ago, and that narrative was picked up by state leaders, media, National right-wing media ran with this story because it fed a narrative that, you know, uh, uh, our, our victories 
indigenous communities' victories to reclaim spaces, to protect our resources, was actually now inhibiting our ability to combat climate disasters and feeding a narrative that propped up disaster capitalism, which is, in this instance, was an effort to, to water grab. And fast forward, our governor, uh, Josh Green, last just within a, two weeks ago, apologized for that incident to our community. Um, but it took a year, and the damage had already been done. People's reputations were jeopardized. Um, and, and I just share that story because this is the struggle of indigenous communities. We stand up, we're on the front line, we fight, we exhaust resources, we shut down projects for the benefit of all of us. And what wasn't shared in that narrative in Lahaina is that the conditions that were created that made a tinder, that created a tinderbox essentially was the industry's legacy, the sugar industry's legacy, diverting the water, drying out the land. Yeah, and so, you know, when we talk about rematriating resources, which NDN Collective is doing, um, we have to talk about the risk and the struggle that our communities take to protect our resources for the good of all of us. And I want to acknowledge the folks in the communities who are struggling after Hurricane Helene. And there's another hurricane backing that up right now, right into Florida. And, it's, and, and, and these, these aren't going to get any easier. And this struggle, while we represent and advocate for indigenous community and our voice and our solutions to be given standing in these discussions, these are challenges we're all going to face. And we have to look at each other equally and truthfully and honestly and recognize what our roles have been to contribute and create the conditions that we're immediately facing. And I'll just stop there for now. Oh, thank, thank you. you. That's really great. Um, thank you. Yeah. So Ryan, your organization, REAMP, does a lot of work in rural communities, and there are a lot of environmental challenges. And I don't know that you'll necessarily hear the phrase environmental justice used a lot in, in some parts of rural America, but what, what does environmental justice look like in those more rural areas? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm actually from a rural community in California. Um, I grew up on a, in an agricultural farm. I, I was a field laborer for, for four years, uh, as, as was my father. So I, I have a good sense of agriculture, especially as it relates to the Midwest. But I'd like to take you on a geographic tour to try and help us understand environmental justice as it impacts the Midwest. So one of the ways in which we get something like this water bottle here, this plastic water bottle made out of polyethylene terephytrate, is, um, oops, uh, through the use of fracking. So just going south of here, southeast across the Mississippi, you end up in a small town called Maiden Rock, a town of 119 people, where they have some of the best sand because of the type of silica that's in the sand. They need to extract that sand and then bring it to North Dakota, but in that extraction process, they blow up bluffs. And so the bluffs, of course, create a whole bunch of uh, air pollution debris that then the children breathe and they have issues of asthma there. Then they ship it right along two miles away, 35W, either by truck or through St. Paul by train. They go out north central Minnesota and out through Fargo and then west all the way across North Dakota and they end up on Fort Berthold, um, North Dakota, which is a Native American reservation. There's three tribes there. Those three, um, it's, the, it's got the highest concentration of fracking of any reservation on in the, in the continental United States. And with that concentration of fracking, they also have a lot of flaring, which you guys may know is the, is the flames that come out of the, the uh, pipes at night. You can see them or venting where they don't actually set it on fire, but they just vent the methane and other toxic uh, pollutants into the air. And so this Native American community, a fairly impoverished Native American communities are heavily impacted by this extraction then it needs to be processed or refined. And so they send it down to Clinton, Iowa. So through South Dakota down to, to Iowa, where they extract it and they create petroleum. But one of the byproducts is ethylene, 
which is what will end up becoming this plastic water bottle. Then this plastic water bottle, then they need to take the, those pellets, those plastic pellets, they send it up to uh, Westland, Michigan, where they process it into the water bottle, and then it ends up on Nicollet, uh, Nicollet Island. So I'll spend about an hour consuming this water, and then it will end up in the Hennepin Energy Recovery Center, where, where it will be incinerated. Uh, which creates energy, of course, but also creates pollutants as well. And if you were to look at the EPA map around the HERC, is, uh, it's only two miles away. Uh, you, you'll see that it's, it's mostly impoverished communities or disadvantaged communities that live near the HERC. So just this water bottle tells us the story of rural communities being impacted or overburdened by pollution, tribal communities being overburdened by pollution, and Minneapolis communities being overburdened by pollution. And I'm fortunate enough to live south of here in Bloomington, so I don't live near a power plant. I don't live near an incinerator. I don't live near a fracking site. And so I have the privilege, I'm not overburdened like many of these other communities are. And so when we think about environmental justice, we need to be thinking about that burden. And we also need to be thinking about something that's been brought up a couple of times, which is Hurricane Helene and, and the future of natural disasters. Uh, that was my area of specialty is natural disasters. They're both going to be increasing in intensity and in number in the future. There's just no doubt about it. That's what the science says. So when we think about it, we need to be thinking in the rural areas about agriculture, right? They're going to be it, both drought and floods are a huge risk to agriculture throughout this country. So water is both very much life-giving, right? 60% of our body is made up of water, and yet it's ultimately very, very destructive as well. And so unfortunately, I think through our consumerist habits, we are actually creating more and more problems for the future that we're going to have to deal with due to the climate crisis. You were mentioning the hurricane a moment ago as well, and our team made a reference at the beginning, you know, we live in Minnesota, we don't have hurricanes, but when I, I saw it was happening in, especially in, in Appalachia, where these communities are at the, at the bases of mountains or on hillsides, it actually reminded me of something that's happened now twice in the last decade up in Duluth, where a deluge of rainwater comes through and it overburdens a series of streams and creeks and causes a lot of damage, frankly. Um, so I don't, you know, folks here are probably aware of that. Some folks may even be here from Duluth. Uh, and so that kind of goes to the earlier point of we don't have hurricanes here, but we still have some of the same effects. Uh, maybe not en masse the way they're seeing in North Carolina, but it's still happening. That's absolutely correct. And if you think about rural communities, they are rural, right? They're disconnected often from federal and state resources. So if a bridge goes down, like in Asheville, they, then they can't actually get resources to them. And that's the case in a lot of different rural communities. Uh, they're at a, a much higher risk because of being so far away. Uh, hospitals are being closed down in rural areas because there's this mass migration from rural to urban areas. So it's harder for rural folks to be able to get health care and address their health care needs because because they live in rural areas. And, and so not only is it agriculture, but it's also infrastructure risk, and it's also the availability of resources that they, that they have trouble with. Joanne, we're also, obviously we're here as a foundation, and there's uh, conversations about funders and philanthropy within the environmental justice area. So what is the role uh, for funders and philanthropy in environmental justice? Thank you, Tom. Um, I'd probably add on to some of the things that RT said in the very beginning. Um, our role and our responsibility, I think, is to be proximate to community, understand the issues that are facing our various communities, and that we have the opportunity to add to that value. I mean, just by the current speakers, you could just capture a glimpse of the knowledge and the expertise that they bring to this particular issue, and that we had the advantage of being able to hear that today. So I always see the role of philanthropy to be in that role of proximity and listening 
Not that we're coming up with the ideas and what the solutions are, but we're listening as we understand, the communities understand what they're facing. They have the best strategies. They have the history of what the conditions and why the conditions are as they are today. So I view that as a very key role for us in philanthropy and to use the resources that we have to help support the work that's happening across our communities and representing, again, if you want to call that democracy and that involvement of people solving the problems that represent their ideas and their strategies to correct some of these very adverse issues that are happening. And then also as funders, and I think we hold, hold a role that um, is very important um, for us to understand that it's not necessarily our money. You've heard about kind of the history of extraction and where a lot of the funding comes from. So we always have to be kind of conscious of that as we're making some of these um, engagements of community, these partnerships and these conversations, is to really understand that <clears throat> and how that is an unfair advantage in some cases because money means power. And it's very something that has to be, I think, mindful and at the forefront of everything that we do in this particular work. I think as foundations then, we can do things singularly. We can create kind of our uh, priorities for funding and that works well. Uh, but we also have the advantage of collectively coming together as funders and creating uh, collaboratives. It could be collaboratives for learning about the issue, raising the issue more, uh, and making it more prominent across our communities, calling it to light for others, for people like you, uh, to, to understand kind of what the issue is perhaps further than you do in your personal lives. And I, I don't want to um, not undermine the, the personal aspect of this work and for you as well, that there is this sense of statistics and we can talk about the numbers and what's happening and various things when we're talking about the environment and what it's doing. And, and having that knowledge is, is, is important. But I think we also have to think about this part, what moves us, what's important to us, what is that emotional attachment? And hearing just the story now that you talked about this water, starting from the simple story about the water and making it very personal is part of that process. So having a convening like this is giving us that opportunity as funders to kind of raise this in a different way so that you can hear our stories, our personal stories, and relate that to your personal stories as well. And then finally, what I'd like to say, um, as funders, we can come together collectively or we can work individually. We can hire and have special programs, as RT mentioned, that climate action and climate and economic justice is one of our priorities for funding at the Minneapolis Foundations. Um, but we can do these things um, and try to do it with no harm for the most part of this, kind of almost like with medical practices, like we do not want to do harm. And so we have this great opportunity before us now with the EPA funding, and you've heard just a little bit about this is the largest investment of uh, EPA funding to deal with environmental justice. This legislation didn't happen alone. It happened because of the work of individuals that are represented here and representing their communities and our communities that were saying, we need to be involved. We need to be part of this. We need to be part of those solutions. And so we are so honored that the Minneapolis Foundation as a community foundation, because of some of our relationships and talking with the REAMP and Midwest Environmental Justice Network and bringing in Indian Collective, that we were asked to be part of this opportunity to apply for EPA funding. Minneapolis Foundation did not say, we're gonna apply for this funding. We listened to the community. The community came to us, individuals, the organizers, the, the policy makers, and said that we'd like to be able to partner with you because you are a community foundation. You can accept dollars on our behalf. You do have a mechanism for getting dollars out the door. You are grant makers, you know that. We want you to be part of our partners in this business. They didn't come to us and say, you guys are the experts. You know how to do this work across the region five, which is not our area of focus. Um, but bringing that trust and that faith in each other has brought this great opportunity for us as the Minneapolis Foundation and as a community foundation to elevate this here through this mechanism and what we're doing here today as part of the Minnesota meeting. But 
also elevating this across the region because of our community foundation. Our president, R.T. Ryback, made it his first point to have contact with other community foundations across the six state area to give them the message of why we're doing this, why it's important for them to think about their role as community foundations and how they can support this initiative going forward. Well, and I, I want to continue with the storytelling, too, as, as was alluded to, because when, when we think about environmental justice and what I'm gleaning here is that the folks really at the heart of this work are not on the evening news. They're not well known beyond maybe their local communities. So I would really love to just kind of spin through here and hear from each of you a change maker, a hero, doing something that might seem by someone's measurement small, but is really, you know, making a change and making a, di a difference. So, Davis, I'm gonna start with you, and, and then we'll just go down the line, and I just, wanna, I just wanna hear stories at this point, so go for it. Well, I think the first, I, I just, I'll reference Nick Tilson. He's our, he's our CEO and president for, for Indian Collective, and it was his vision that launched this organization that was really, that's really aiming and effectively transforming American philanthropy uh, in ways that are meant to unlock not just resources but power for our for our people, our communities, and it's and he's really opened his arms to indigenous communities all over the world, and um, and that's in the spirit of all of our indigenous knowledge systems, which no matter if we're in the middle of the Pacific or if we're in the eastern part of the United States. The interconnectedness of all things is what drives our decision making balance and so when we do things and we're and these relationships are often connected and made in struggle it's how this hawaiian you know i ended up working with ndn collective through connections made um to the standing rock occupation to you know step protect that water and our struggle back home to protect our sacred mountain from desecration, Mauna Kea, two large scale standoffs that, you know, our indigenous communities challenge the status quo, power structures, for the purpose of restoring balance, advocating for balance, for protection, again, of our environment for all of us. And, um, you know, when I think about, and so Nick launched Indian Collective, and then a couple, you know, just my role now as climate justice initiative director and why we're involved with this work stems from the recognition that um, more resources to be unlocked. The federal government made an unprecedented investment, not just with its EPA program, but through the IRA um, of $1.7 billion, the largest investment in climate change efforts ever. On the, and that's the result of decades of advocacy and activism from the environmental justice communities. And out of, because of that investment, because that investment was made, you know, NDN recognized that we need to ensure that our frontline communities have equitable access. So launched the Climate Justice Initiative, which is really aimed at leveraging private philanthropic dollars for our communities so that our communities and indigenous-led organizations could be positioned to access, better positioned to access the federal dollars. And a lot of what we see, these gaps that, are, that, that exist and what has historically prevented our communities from accessing these, these monies is capacity. And really capacity is just knowledge of how systems work. These systems weren't designed for grassroots communities to access the money. You know, federal resources is highly bureaucratic, and I don't want to get down that rabbit hole, which is kind of the impetus of this program that we'll, you'll learn more about with the EPA. But ultimately, you know, our initiative is, is aimed, our climate justice initiative is uh, aimed at helping our communities be better positioned to access the federal resources. And uh, that's what our climate justice initiative fund uh, is, was created for, and that's why we're involved with this work. Really putting our money where our mouth is, meaning we're gonna invest our time and resources to make sure that this program is rolled out effectively and our community is represented. 
Well, I, I think I would initially turn it back to all of you, and I wish I could meet each one of you and hear your stories, because I'm sure there are so many good ones out there. I just want to share, sticking with the rural, is uh, about Duane, who uh, works with Clean Up the River Environment, Minnesota. And I love hearing stories that just, that just blow my mind, like, like, what? Like, that's just so brilliant what you're working on. And so that organization right now is reaching out to rural communities who are being... Uh, invited, I guess would be the term that I use, by corporations, by non nonprofit organizations uh, to have new solar uh, put onto their land or new wind generation. Again, as um, Davis mentioned, $1.7 billion is going towards energy. So there's a lot of people, a lot of corporations really interested in energy production. So they're reaching out or maybe it's a new pipeline that they want to put through their community. So you're going to these rural communities of a thousand people and these corporations come with a team of lawyers and say, hey, we want to create this contract with you. Let's, um, here's the deal. This is what we're going to do. Here's all the benefits for you. Let's, let's get it signed. And these rural communities are like, their heads are spinning. And so what Cure Minnesota is doing right now is they're doing a lot of capacity building, a lot of education, a lot of preparation, and helping them get legal support as well so that they can actually uh, negotiate and advocate for themselves a better deal when they do go into contract with these corporations or these organizations. Uh, and so for, for me, that, that kind of work I had never thought about it before, but it's, it's absolutely so critical to supporting the local, empowering the local, and really helping them ensure that they have long-term sustainability for their community. Not for the profits, not for the good of, of energy, depend, uh, democracy, for everyone. No, that they actually have the power to stand up and say, this is good for us. Yeah. Um. I would say that I think being my age and being at this moment in the environmental justice movement, it's really humbling to think about how many community leaders have come before us and um, the number of unsung heroes, the, the mothers and the community members that have sacrificed so much that we'll just never really know their names of. Um, but I'd say one local person I want to lift up, and I don't know if she's, I haven't seen her yet here today, but Roxanne O'Brien, who's a daughter of North Minneapolis, as am I. Um, we've talked a little bit about North Minneapolis having uh, multiple polluters in our neighborhood with the HERC and, and other facilities. And Roxanne, who's also on the leadership team of the Midwest EJ Network, um, she's also a mother of three and has been organizing with other mothers in the community for a long time to lift up the issues of the Northern Metals uh, metal shredder in North Minneapolis and worked really hard to elevate some of those issues along with a number, a number of other community members to eventually have that facility shut down because it was polluting the neighborhood. Um, and what I love about Roxanne's story is that she is one of so many folks that have come together in North Minneapolis to do that type of organizing and to shut down the facility, but she didn't really stop there. She's also continued to work really hard to make sure that we're in, envi in the environmental justice movement locally. We're not just working facility by facility, but we're also making policy change. And so she was one of a coalition of frontline organizers to help achieve that cumulative impacts law that I mentioned earlier. And then going a step further too and thinking about what how when we're shutting down these facilities, what could a just transition look like? What could a, a community focused plan look like in a regenerative economy? And so thinking about they're working now on um, purchasing that Northern Metals facility and turning it into a community controlled center where there can be arts, youth, um, environmental justice work happening. And I think that like bringing it back to this program, this is a, like a perfect opportunity where we know where communities of color are often only invested in in times of crisis. And so what's so um, what's so exciting about this, the EPA funding is that we have an opportunity to build some, to do community place making, making to build community assets um, that's not just in a time of crisis, but able to step back and think about what we want our communities to look like. And so I think Roxanne's work in, Roxanne and a, community, a wide community of people around her, I see Elder Michael Cheney there in the back and other folks um, that have been organizing in the community for a long time. But I, I love that story because she's taken it to like fighting the facility all the way to re revisioning what it could look like. And I think in our late stage capitalism, this extractive economy we're a part of, um, we need to think about how we're, we're rebuilding. Oh, thank you. Uh, the person that 
I would like to recognize, and I'm not sure if she's here, I know she's registered, is Sharon Day, and I know she's going to be featured in one of our films. Uh, Sharon Day is uh, like a sister to me. She is from the Boys Fort Reservation in northern Minnesota, and I'm from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. And we met over 40 years ago when we were both working at the state of Minnesota. I was working for the Indian Affairs Council, and she was working for the Chemical Dependency Program Division at the state. Um, we were um, kind of like kindred spirits, uh, young Native women at that point, highly energetic, wanting to change the world. And, uh, and Sharon continues, I think, to change the world. She's currently the executive director of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force. Uh, and this is an organization that focuses on HIV prevention and across the Native community, bringing in cultural teachings and values and, and sacred use of tobacco, and also working with a, a youth um, performance group that uses a form of performing arts and storytelling uh, to bring this to a higher attention with, within our communities and across other communities. Uh, but Sharon, beyond that, uh, was a person who uh, really, really held on to her cultural beliefs and cultural values and honoring her grandmother and her mother and her role uh, that she carries similar to that today. Um, she is a water walker. Nibi is water. You heard that in Hyde's uh, introduction and in talking about the poems. Nibi means water. And she has used uh, our cultural beliefs and our values and how we think about the universe uh, and trying to bring to light uh, the importance of protecting our water. She has uh, was first involved with Cold Spring, which is just near the airport, but sacred ground. Over 20 years ago, there was a controversy of how that was going to be disturbed and destroyed. From there, she continued to build on that and has now been known for getting other elders, other women, mostly women, I will say young women, other Native women, to go on these very long walks. She has walked from the heads of the Mississippi down to the Gulf of Mississippi, that's, I don't know, 1,700 miles, carrying a sacred copper pail of the water from originally from the headwaters all the way down to where the Gulf is. She's done walks around Lake Superior similarly, again, to bring heightened awareness to the public about the importance of the water and what that means to us, and its sacredness for us as Native people. She's been involved in Pipe 3, uh, the, the, the line as well, and, and bringing to light, again, the cultural aspects. It's a protest, but she would never say this is a protest. She wants to bring that message clear that water is important to us, water takes care of us, and we need to hold this in a sacred, sacred belief in how we think about this. And that is her message. Young, young unassuming person who's now taken on this role of absolute leadership that you would not necessarily ever see on the news but she is one of my sheroes for sure. We have a question from the audience here uh, for Eartha. <clears throat> what is most commonly misunderstood about your work and how does it hinder collective action? Um, I would say, I think one thing when I was thinking about like what is, what is like a, the common theme that connects. So Midwest EJ Network is a network of over 75 organizations working on some type of environmental justice across a 12 state region of the Midwest. So we have a really diverse geography within the Midwest. And I think that um, one thing that can be difficult to understand is that environmental justice issues are so intersectional. So our organizations, when you think about the organizations within our portfolio, our partners, um, you might not necessarily see environmental justice always in their name or um, in their mission statement, but they might be working on um, housing issues or economic development or education or reproductive justice. Um, but because of the interconnectedness of environmental justice, environmental health being so core to communities, and our organizations are really grassroots communities, so they're grounded in community issues. 
um, environmental justice permeates all of that. And so I think sometimes that can be confusing as we're thinking about how do we fund environmental justice organizations or folks doing environmental justice work. It's really at the intersection of all of these social and economic systems that we're working on. That's something that comes to top of mind. That's great. I want to I wanna now bring up um, one of my new colleagues, Jumana Vasi, who joined the Minneapolis Foundation to, to talk about one of the main reasons why we're here today. Uh, Jumana is the program director for our Thriving Communities grant making and we'll talk about how this conversation that we've been having here translates into a new body of work you've been hearing about through the Environmental Protection Agency and what these four organizations are doing um, that they're about to launch and you're kind of in on the ground floor on, on talking about some of this so uh, so stay tuned. Jumana. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, everybody. I just want to give a round of applause to my colleagues who... Uh, um, I am so lucky I get to work with these amazing, brilliant people every day. And before, I, I don't want to lose the thread, so I also want to point out all of the other people that are helping with the program. I've got colleagues there in the back at the Minneapolis Foundation, if you want to stand up and raise your hands. Um, and Tori, who is with us here from NDN Collective. But this work doesn't happen just with a couple people, and there are so many of us working together. So what is this EPA grant-making program? It's called the Thriving Communities Grant-Making Program, and we are one of nine other regions, one of 10 regions that is giving, um, that has the opportunity to invest and re-grant $40 million into environmental justice communities and to do the work that my colleagues have been talking about. I came to this work as from the Midwest EJ Network, so I had a chance to work with Eartha. And for seven years, I worked really hard to raise about one and a half million dollars for us to re-grant over 12 states. And um, we had a rise from 100,000 a year to 1.5 million, and then we plateaued. And it was hard to think about how we could possibly raise any more money when this EPA grant-making program came about. And to go from $1.5 million a year to give away $40 million over three years was just uh, unimaginable. What a great opportunity. And to do something that uh, built, we've heard a lot about capacity and to me, capacity is the people, the people on the stage, the people in the room, and $40 million allows people to get paid for the work that they are doing already or want to be doing, but it also builds a network and the organizational systems to support the people. And so uh, I can talk more about it later, but I, I have another. So it's across six states, 36 tribal, federally recognized tribal communities. Um, and what is this, how can this be a catalyst in this, it's region five as it's known to in EPA world, but how can this be a catalyst across the whole region for environmental justice? Well, uh, thank you for the question. And first of all, it's being able to have these conversations a lot. The reason that you asked the question about the un sort of unsung here as an invisible work is that we don't get a lot of public attention from this. But once the EPA puts and the government puts in big money, people are listening. So one of the reasons we have these conversations and you get to hear from my amazing colleagues on the ground, we're also um, keep collectively keeping an eye out uh, to think about how we build community, regional community, not just amongst grant recipients, but a lot of partners and allies who are in the room as well. So we hope at the end of three years that not only will the individual organizations be stronger, but that our network and community will be stronger, not just of environmental justice groups, but of funders, of environmental partners, universities, and others. Who, who can apply? I think you re referenced it just a moment ago, but who can apply and when does it get started? Uh, we, so fingers crossed, we will get the EPA approval to start in a couple weeks. And our program officer from the EPA is here, Christina Presmanes. Do you want to stand up so everyone can see you? <laughs> okay, Christina's way back there. Okay, so uh, Christina's working really hard with us to try to get um, all of the approvals that we need in place. And so, uh, fingers crossed, we will in a couple weeks be able to hit go. In the meantime, we have uh, we have a website that 
eventually will be on the screen, maybe. And if not, we have the information on the um, at a table out back. Who can apply? It is open to nonprofit organizations, federally recognized tribes, local governments, and uh, institutions of higher education. I'll just, I'll just read out that website for folks who are playing along at home. They're greatlakestcgm.org. You can also use this QR code. And as all of you registered here today, we will be sending follow-up emails as well. So whenever the, the, the day is, is upon us, uh, we'll be sending out notes. But start thinking, right? Start thinking about organizations and local governments and higher ed institutions that might be good candidates for this uh, as well. Absolutely. What we're looking for are community-led applications that address environmental issues that they prioritize in their own communities and, um, and an array of different, we have different grant sizes and there's a lot more detail I won't bore you with now, but please share this information with your partners, rural, urban, tribal, and um, help us get the word out. Thank you, Jamana. And please, let's hear for our panelists uh, as well, Eartha Borabell, Joanne Stately. Davis Price and Dr. Ryan Alanese uh, as well. A great conversation.